Flight 10 represented a pivotal milestone for SpaceX's Starship program, demonstrating the rocket's resilience after a series of earlier setbacks. With that success behind them, attention now shifts toward the next big leap, Flight 11. At the heart of this mission is Ship 38, the last Block 2 upper stage in the lineup. Currently housed in Mega Bay 2, it has all six Raptor engines and aft flaps installed and is nearing static fire testing, the last step before launch. The booster for Flight 11 remains unconfirmed, but options point to either the flight-proven Booster 15 from Flight 8 or the new Booster 17. Reusing Booster 15 would reinforce SpaceX's push for hardware recovery and cost reduction, while Booster 17 would debut updated design improvements. While the exact flight profile for Flight 11 is not yet public, mounting evidence suggests it could mark Starship's first orbital attempt, diverging from the suborbital arcs of prior tests. Recently, teams unloaded at least 20 dummy satellites from the Starlink dispenser loading box in the Star Factory, the same mass simulators used in flights to test Starship's payload deployment system. On Flight 10, Ship 37 deployed eight of these dummies into space, which followed the ship's suborbital trajectory before disintegrating during atmospheric re-entry over the Indian Ocean. This was a breakthrough moment, building on earlier incomplete attempts. Flights 7 and 8 ended prematurely, and Flight 9 lost attitude control, preventing deployment. Flight 10 finally proved that the payload bay door and dispenser worked reliably in space. The dummies now removed were likely intended for Ship 38 as a backup test if Flight 10 had failed. With that success achieved, the need for more dummy deployments is gone. Their removal points to a new goal, loading real Starlink V2 satellites for orbital release. If confirmed, Flight 11 would attempt orbital insertion, release operational satellites, then conduct a deorbit burn for a controlled return. The unexpected unloading strongly suggests this escalation, and the next step would be the delivery of real Starlink satellites to Starbase for loading into Ship 38. Flight 11 could therefore mark Starship's transition from testing mechanisms to carrying live payloads, directly expanding SpaceX's broadband constellation. If Flight 11 achieves orbit, Ship 38 would perform a de-orbit burn, marking the first attempt of its kind for Starship. The maneuver would draw propellant from the header tanks, ensuring stable propellant flow in microgravity, and lower the vehicle's perigee so that it intersects Earth's atmosphere. This capability has already been partially validated by in-space Raptor relight tests on Flights 6 and 10, but Flight 11 would represent the first time it is executed as part of a full orbital return sequence. After re-entry, Ship 38 will not attempt a tower catch at Starbase. As Elon Musk confirmed, those high-risk recoveries are reserved for flights 13 through 15, provided Block 3 vehicles beginning with Flight 12 prove reliable. Instead, Ship 38 will target a controlled splashdown, most likely in the Indian Ocean. Because orbital mechanics rarely align ground tracks after a single orbit, the vehicle may circle Earth several times until it passes over the Indian Ocean, at which point it can execute the deorbit burn and return to Earth. This ocean landing is not just a safety measure, it is a critical data-gathering mission. Previous Starship re-entries have been suborbital at 5 to 6 kilometers per second, producing lower heating and shorter exposure. An orbital return will push conditions far harder, approximately 7.8 kilometers per second entry speeds, sharper heating rates, extended thermal soak on the heat shield, and higher aerodynamic loads. SpaceX will use Flight 11 to assess how the thermal protection tiles and aerodynamic flaps perform together under these stresses, from tile durability and heat flux patterns to flap stability and plasma-driven forces, demonstrating both heat shield resilience and aerodynamic control during the belly flop descent from orbit is essential before Starship can risk a tower catch. Preparations for Flight 11 are already underway at the launch site, starting with routine post-flight refurbishment after Flight 10. Booster 16's 33 Raptor engines left scorch marks and minor wear on the orbital launch mount, which are now being inspected and repaired. In parallel, the launch tower arms are being cycled to confirm smooth stacking operations. Once refurbishment is complete, the site will reopen for testing, beginning with a full-duration static fire of the booster chosen for Flight 11. Afterward, the mount will be reconfigured for Ship 38 static fire by installing a temporary test stand inside the launch mount and adding a dedicated propellant feed system over the booster quick disconnect, similar to the setup used for Ship 37's campaign. 
If SpaceX maintains its recent turnaround pace, Flight 11 could follow just two weeks after Ship 38's static fire, pointing to a possible late October launch window, barring delay. Flight 11 will also close out the Block 2 era, paving the way for Block 3 with Ship 39 and Booster 18. Ship 39's nose cone is already stacked onto its payload bay in the Star Factory, with full integration in Mega Bay 2 expected soon. Booster 18 is advancing as well, featuring a redesigned, stronger methane transfer tube, as well as grid fins with improved aerodynamics. Beyond that lies the even more ambitious Block 4, taller, more powerful, and optimized for rapid reusability. Together, these new vehicles represent the step change Starship needs to transition from experimental flights to operational missions. Meanwhile, SpaceX leadership is voicing strong confidence in Starship's future. President and COO Gwynne Shotwell recently reaffirmed Starship's readiness to support NASA's Artemis III lunar landing, countering skepticism fueled by past failures. Her comments reflect SpaceX's broader strategy, leveraging rapid, iterative flights to hit key milestones such as propellant transfer demos and eventual human rating. Building on that message, Elon Musk turned to the growing skepticism over on-orbit refueling, directly pushing back against former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine's September 3rd Senate testimony. Bridenstein and several members argued that such a capability had never been achieved and was therefore impractical, while also questioning the complexity of Starship's lunar lander design and the lack of a viable backup option. The architecture is as such. We need to launch Starship. That first Starship is a fueling depot that's in orbit around the Earth. Then we need to launch, nobody really knows, nobody knows, but it could be up to dozens of additional Starships to refuel the first Starship. So imagine launching Starship over and 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 over, dozens of times, no delays, no explosions, to refuel the first Starship. Then once it's fully refueled, then that Starship has to fuel another Starship that is in fact human rated, which that process hasn't even started yet. By the way, that whole in-space refueling thing has never been tested either. We're talking about cryogenic liquid oxygen, cryogenic liquid methane being transferred in space, never been done before, and we're gonna do it dozens of times, and then we're gonna have a human-rated starship that is refueled that goes all the way to the moon. Now, when it goes to the moon, we don't know how long it can be there because it's boiling off the entire time it's in orbit around the moon. We don't know how long it can be there, but while it's there, we have to launch the SLS, we have to launch the Orion, the European service module, we have to have astronauts and crew all ready to go. And they have to, they have to orbit the moon themselves in that window, that window when Starship is around the moon, and then they have to dock around the moon, they have to transfer from the Orion into the Starship, it has to go down and land. When it's on the surface of the moon, Starship is gone, or uh, Orion is gone for the next seven days until it comes back around in near rectilinear halo orbit. So our astronauts are right now planning to be on the surface of the moon for a period of seven days without any way home. This is an architecture that no NASA administrator that I'm aware of would have selected had they had the choice. But it was a decision that was made in the absence of a NASA administrator in the last administration. He went further, suggesting that since NASA is now unlikely to win the lunar race with China, the agency should instead pivot to promoting the gateway as the ultimate high ground, framing its establishment in the late 2020s as a strategic victory. Musk dismissed the doubt with characteristic confidence, clarifying that refueling between starships is far simpler than docking with the International Space Station, because the maneuver involves the, the same vehicle design connecting to itself rather than two different spacecraft. In other words, starship-to-starship -starship docking eliminates many alignment and interface complexities, making the operation significantly more manageable. He emphasized that the engineering challenge is well within the company's capabilities and will be demonstrated repeatedly with Block 3 vehicles next year. In short, the message is clear. SpaceX will have Starship ready for Artemis 3 on schedule no earlier than mid-2027, with all flights and demos completed to meet NASA's requirements. The tougher milestones Bridenstine pointed to, from the journey to the moon, precision landings with astronauts, and bringing them home safely, remain ahead. But SpaceX aims to tackle them one by one, just as it has already made reusability, tower catches, and launching the world's most powerful rocket a reality. What do you think? Are Bridenstine's doubts fair, or will SpaceX prove once again that the impossible is only temporary? Let me know in the comments. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. 
NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission has uncovered stardust grains older than the sun in samples from asteroid Bennu, turning it into a cosmic time capsule of the early solar system. Launched in September 2016, OSIRIS-REx set out to study Bennu in order to better understand solar system formation and assess potential asteroid impact risks to Earth. After a two-year journey, the spacecraft arrived at Bennu in December 2018 and spent the next two years mapping and studying the asteroid to find the perfect sampling site. In October 2020, it successfully touched down, collecting about 121 grams of material, marking NASA's first successful asteroid sample collection. The spacecraft departed Bennu in May 2021, and in September 2023, the sample capsule parachuted into the Utah desert. From there, it was transported to NASA's Johnson Space Center for detailed analysis. Earlier this year, researchers reported that Bennu's samples contained 33 amino acids and five nucleobases, the essential building blocks of DNA, RNA, and ultimately life. Now, scientists have made an even more extraordinary discovery. Pre-solar grains, microscopic particles of stardust older than our 4.6 billion-year-old solar system. These grains were forged billions of years ago in dying stars. When red giants and supernovae expelled their outer layers, they scattered dust enriched with rare isotopes into interstellar space. Over time, this dust collected into massive molecular clouds. Roughly 4.6 billion years ago, one such cloud collapsed to form our sun and its protoplanetary disk. Most of the ancient grains were destroyed in that violent process, but a fraction survived, preserved within primitive objects like asteroids. Bennu's parent body, part of the Polana family of dark carbon-rich asteroids, formed in the cold outer solar system, where it captured and protected these relics. Later collisions shattered that body, and Bennu emerged carrying fragments of this ancient stardust. An international research team analyzed Bennu's regolith with advanced instruments and detected isotopic anomalies, especially in titanium-50, an isotope extremely rare in solar system materials, but abundant in dust formed through stellar nucleosynthesis. This unique isotopic fingerprint confirmed that the grains predate the sun itself. The discovery elevates Bennu into a true cosmic archive. Its parent body gathered material from many sources, pre-solar stardust, interstellar organics, ices, and high-temperature minerals from the inner solar system. Some of these ingredients have remained unchanged for billions of years, offering a pristine record of the raw materials that built planets and possibly life. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.